Thank you very much for joining me on the news. Our Neil deGrasse Tyson, author, astrophysicist, and once again, we meet at a time which is extremely exciting for India. The first ever Indian reaching the International Space Station. Momentous occasion for us, but how momentous do you think this achievement is? And uh, the ambitions of space uh, that India has had all these years. Well, so first, welcome aboard. <laughs> it's an international space station. And if if I understand correctly, I, all the other countries represented on this voyage, it's also their first time to the International Space Station. And so it's a reminder of what the I stands for in ISS, international. And yes, 41 years is way too long. Uh, let it not be that long on the next round. Uh, and it's a reminder that the exploration of space uh, is and needs to continue to be uh, a, a, a group effort, uh, an international uh, enterprise, because no one person can own space. And so uh, just congratulations to India and also to uh, Hungary and Poland for participating in this. Let me, let me ask you, as we speak, uh, Dr. Tyson, the SpaceX Dragon capsule carrying the AX4 uh, crew, including the Indian astronaut Subhanshu Shukla, has docked at the International Space Station. Could you walk our viewers through what exactly happened during this docking phase? It looks very easy, very simple uh, to all of us <laughs> sitting here. Uh, but why is this most uh, critical and technically complex part of any mission? Well, just a reminder, it really is rocket science, the whole thing. <laughs> so so it, it takes smart people working hard, uh, scientists and engineers. Uh, also, a funding source back there somewhere <laughs> makes all of this happen. So from launch, uh, the rocket goes up in multiple stages so that the rocket doesn't have to carry dead weight from a booster that's already exhausted its fuel. So once you get a section that used up its fuel, you discard that, and then the energy for what remains gets to push something lighter than it previously was. So this continues, takes about eight minutes to get to orbit, and the, the Krug Dragon capsule, um, if it's a typical one, I didn't see the full plan, but if it's typical, it will ascend to, from below and then find the docking location with the International Space Station and then dock. And the collars have to line up exactly, but we have ways to make sure that happens. And so in the old days, it was like, you know, are we there? Are we not? You know, everything can be automated today to reduce the risk. And then once the collars are connected, then you open an airlock and then you just fly through, close back down the airlock, and they are welcomed by the other half dozen or so astronauts on the station. So let me ask you, this orbital ballet, uh, so to speak, that happens, the Dragon capsule slowly, precisely aligning with the Harmony ma module of the ISS, for the average viewer, uh, could there, ha you said it's very automated, but could there have been a slip between the cup and the lip, uh, whatever it's called in the space terminology? Yeah, so, so uh, one way to respond to that question is, has that ever happened before? All right, you know, how reliable is this system? And I don't know of any serious cases where the alignment did not occur causing a problem. Because the way the collars work, the, it doesn't, it's not an, it doesn't have to match exactly, it just has to match approximately, and then it keeps moving together and then locks into place. So, so I, it's, it, it, the risk there was very low. There are plenty of other risks elsewhere in the launch. Uh, for example, we've all seen rockets, fortunately unmanned, uh, uncrewed, where they blow up on the launch pad, right? There's a lot of fuel there on the launch pad, for example. So, uh, but there are risks all throughout. And an interesting thing to think about is every one of those risks is additive 
all right? In other words, there's a percent chance that this will fail, a percent chance that that will fail. You add all of that up and you get the total risk that the astronaut faces. Now, the astronaut is not unmindful of these risks. They know they're taking risk. That's part of what makes them heroic in this effort. They're doing things that are dangerous for the greater good of civilization. So let me ask you, what happens next once uh, this crew gets into the NASA space station? Uh, what are the kind of protocols uh, that they will need to go through in terms of medical or atmospheric checks? Uh, what happens next? Well, it's a livable space inside the space station. And you just don't weigh anything. So if you've never been to a zero-G environment, then it takes some adjustments, okay? Uh, normally, when you're holding something and you let go, it drops. On the space station, you hold it and it just, and you let go and it just stays there. And there's some fun stories, uh, harmlessly fun stories, where astronauts became so accustomed to living in zero-G that when they got back to Earth, and they drank a beverage, they just let go of it <laughs> and it dropped down and broke the glass. <laughs> you know, yeah. it happens once or twice, you learn quickly, you're no longer in zero G. So for some, they might have to adjust to that. I know for me, I'd have to adjust to zero G. I get queasy stomach uh, on, on, on uh, amusement park rides. So I know I, I'd be uh, a, a queasy astronaut were I to be in the place uh, of those there now. So I, I'm imagining I have a cup of tea in my hand, and if I was in zero G, I could probably drink. Well, you would have to drink through a straw because the liquid wouldn't, wouldn't okay. know All to right. be. To, but I could just stay. leave it, just... it here, and, and the cup would stay here. Yes, yes, it can. It and when I come stay. back uh, to Terra Firma, I will need to recall and get used to the fact that I have to keep it back on the table. Oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> that, that requires some getting used to. Let yes, me... it will. And other things, too. But I'm told the food is pretty good. Uh, people get to bring some of what they call comfort food with them, food that makes them feel like they are at home, even though they're clearly not. Uh, uh, what NASA also does is they will connect an astronaut to someone on Earth by email, via email, where you can just have a conversation as though you were just hanging out with that person. And I was once selected for that. I was very honored to be sort of the, I don't want to call it a lifeline, but a sanity line for someone who, who would uh, just say, oh, how's the universe doing today? And just have a regular conversation with someone back on Earth. So there's a lot of effort given for the mental health of people who go into space, especially those that go for so long. The American astronaut, um, Peggy Whitson, she holds the American record for total number of days in orbit. Not consecutive, but total. So she's highly experienced uh, in this. And uh, so I'm just delighted to see this happen. And again, congratulations to India. A further a, a, a check mark in the, in the steps to become a completely spacefaring nation. So let me let me ask you, when when you were this so-called friend on Earth for uh, uh, the crew member in uh, uh, the International Space Station, what what are the regular conversations like? Uh, do they actually uh, feel lonely up there or is it all work and no play? How, how does it work? What were the uh, benchmark questions that you got? Yeah, so, well, for in my specific conversation, it was just uh, questions about uh, any latest developments in astrophysics. Um, do I know any jokes lately? Uh, there's some fun jokes like, never trust atoms because they make up everything. <laughs> it's just some <laughs> stupid fun jokes you can tell people. Um, and the, uh, but anyhow, so it's just, a, again, it's a sanity check. Uh, not a sanity check, but it's a sanity support. No, I don't, any, all the astronauts I've spoken with never complained of being lonely. There are times you want to be alone, and so you go to your corner of the, of the space station, but other times there are other people there, and they're highly socialized, okay? They, they will talk to you, and they all, and you can learn some of their other languages, and for me, the best part is you get to taste some of the food that they brought up. Okay? 
Uh, there's Russian food. There's Italian food. Uh, there's Indian food. Surely, uh, your yes, man is bringing. Yes, gajar ka halwa and some moong dal ka halwa. You know, these are all <laughs> Indian things. Uh, and and some amras. It's mango season back here, and mango is oh. a hot favorite uh, with all Indians. So some. And amras. another little fact, a, a, a tiny uh, fact that people forget or never think about is the food that they eat needs to be very. Uh, connected to itself, okay? okay, so that pieces don't fly off. So oh. nothing crunchy, where you bite on it and then bits and pieces float away. Okay, uh, and so a lot of things one might spread onto naan that works very well. Naan does not make crumbs very very easily. That's good, okay. okay. Whereas other forms no of biscuit. baked bread. Do yes. So there's there's a lot of pre thinking that goes on to what foods will be there, and I would delight in tasting the foods of other countries that that are brought up. I wish there were a restaurant up there where uh, oh. people could do that. But uh, you know, the old joke about that. If there's ever a restaurant on the moon, it would have very interesting food, but it would have no atmosphere. <laughs> Uh, quite literally speaking, how do you interpret this uh, democratization of human space flight, especially considering commercial platforms like Axiom are facilitating uh, people from different nations, different governments coming together, uh, you know, to, to undertake this? It's been uh, one of these trips after 41 years, but clear democratization that spells uh, some amount of euphoria. Yes, so that's a, 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 a very important question. The, obviously, the early days of space exploration were conducted entirely by governments. And, but let us remember that the governments, uh, certainly in the United States, NASA partnered with private industry to make all of these vessels. So, for example, just as an example, the lunar lander, uh, that was made right here near where I live. I live in New York City. That was made on Long Island, which is attached to New York City in Grumman Aerospace. People today still walk and stand proud that they had participated in that effort. We now live in an era where private enterprise can lead an effort rather than just be tasked by a government agency. And that's a new opening of private enterprise. When uh, Prime Minister Modi visited um, the United States, I met with him and we chatted about the future of uh, the Indian space program. And he, 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 he wanted to see what I thought about him opening the entire effort to private enterprise. And I said, yes. In fact, the United States should have done that decades ago. And so private enterprise will find ways to do things more streamlined, typically, than a government will. And, and it, as to use your word, to democratize it means everybody gets to think about what we might want to do in space. Will we be mining asteroids? Oh, by the way, whoever's mining an asteroid, make sure they know how to deflect one while they're up there. One day we might have to protect Earth. Absolutely. But, but let me ask you, a lot of these astronauts who go uh, to space, uh, symbolism becomes extremely important to them, grounding, uh, uh, you know, carrying their cultural identity, uh, so to speak. For example, Rakesh Sharma, 41 years ago, said, Sare Jahan Se Achha and the tricolor. Uh, Shukla, Subhanshu Shukla says, Namaskar from space and carries a swan with him, which is the sign of wisdom. Uh, do you think these uh, connections, so to speak, become very important uh, when you're up there? Yes, I think so, because they're part of your identity. We should never deny our identity. It only becomes a problem when it becomes nationalistic. If you say, well, my identity is better than your identity, then people wage wars over those kinds of disagreements. But if it's a celebration of the diversity of what it is to be human on this earth, from different parts of earth and different languages, different skin colors, different traditions, oh my gosh, that's, that's what it should be. That's the future that Earth should head towards. And I don't always know that that's the direction it's going. But yes, these are highly, uh, I, I, I celebrate that fact.
Ab very well said. And and when Axiom 4 crew conduct 60 scientific experiments representing 31 countries, focusing on life sciences, earth observation, materials research, clearly this is not going to be restricted to one nation. It is uh, research and development uh, for a whole world, for a whole yeah, new so world. The a very important point you just made. In fact, there's the Artemis Accords, which India has signed. It's a it's a doc and many countries have signed. I forgot the latest number, but I think it's more than a hundred, uh, if not just approaching a hundred, that this document, if you read it, it's very beautiful. It's, we will go into space for peaceful purposes, and if someone is in trouble, you'll go help them. If you make a discovery, that will be shared with other countries. Maybe they'll need to know. How to, uh, you make a discovery that's in the import, that is in the interest of your of the survival of your mission, or just another discovery that's just interesting, that's all gets shared so that there's a commute. The steps we take, though, they're done by individuals and by a country at a given time. When they get shared, in a way, it's all of us who are reaching into space. And, and uh, uh, probably sharing the cost as well, so that all of us can pool in together for these uh, uh, expensive uh, research uh, forays. Uh, any message yes. that you have for the crew up there? Oh, enjoy the ride. And uh, everyone who goes up, they get what's called the overview effect, where you can't see national borders. And all of a sudden, humans in your mind, body, and soul, we all become one. And that's an important revelation. Uh, some people joke, we should take all the leaders of the world and stick them up in space so that they come back as one. <laughs> And, and if they don't agree, before we bring it back, we just leave them up there. <laughs> That's right. And do you know, do you know uh, what is a, a, a dream meeting that uh, I wish to organize, uh, whether uh, in reality or uh, virtually, is uh, when Subhanshu Shukla comes back, having you and him meet and discuss uh, with me somewhere in the middle, being the fly on the wall. <laughs> uh, you discussing space, research the findings, and what future world could have uh, for all of us in redefining the frontiers. That can happen. That can totally happen. Okay. So look forward to that. Thank you very much, Neil deGrasse Tyson. As always, a pleasure and a treat speaking with you. Namaste. Thank you very much for joining me. And uh, uh, all the very best. Uh, and we'll wait for that uh, interlude to happen between you and Subhanshu Shukla. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you.